Welcome to the 2019 Alabama Props webinar series. Um, my name is Audrey Gamble. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Crop Soil and Environmental Sciences at Auburn. And I'm also um, the soil scientist for the Alabama Cooperative Extension System. Today, I'm going to be talking about cover crop systems. Um, so just to get us started, I wanna talk about what a cover crop is and why we use them. So cover crops are crops which are specifically planted um, to provide protection of the soil and benefits to soil quality. So some of the different benefits that we can um, receive depending on what types of cover crops we're, we're planting would be protection against erosion and nutrient loss, improved water infiltration, um, supplemental nitrogen if we're using legumes, scavenging of nutrients, which by nutrient scavenging, I mean um, roots that explore, um, roots from cover crops, which explore deep into the soil profile and bring up nutrients to the, to the soil surface so that the next cash crop can use them. Um, breaking up of soil compaction, conservation of soil moisture, increased organic matter storage, and suppression of weed growth. And so um, really the ultimate goal of using cover crops is to improve um, soil quality so that soils will continue to be productive um, for cash crop production for longer periods of time. And so today I want to talk about several topics related to implementing cover crop systems, including cover crop selection, planting, management, and termination, as well as planting into cover crop residue. So I'm really just going to skim the surface of all these topics and then I'm going to um, point you in the direction of some resources that go um, deeper into these topics um, from the Alabama Cooperative Extension System as well as the Southern Cover Crop Council. Um, so one of the first considerations for producers um, when thinking about implementing cover crop systems is what types of benefits they want to receive. Um, so depending on the benefits that they want, want to receive, they may be um, looking at using different species of crop, cover crops as well as different biomass levels. So we know that with different biomass levels, we can expect to receive different benefits from the cover crops. And so with lower biomass levels, um, we can expect to see protection against erosion and nutrient loss and improvements in water infiltration. And as we increase um, levels of biomass, we can start to see additional benefits, such as conservation of soil moisture, increases in organic matter storage, and some early season um, weed suppression. Um, so when we have high levels of biomass that also have a, a high carbon to nitrogen ratio, that provides a, a thick mat of residue on the soil um, next to the cash crop, which would, can help with um, some of that, that early season weed suppression. So another consideration for producers when deciding what cover crops they want to implement is the species of cover crop. So um, with different species of cover crops, we can expect to observe um, different benefits. So some of the small grains such as uh, cereal rye, oats, wheat, um, those can provide, have the potential to provide some of that high biomass which can assist with weed control and conservation of soil moisture um, as well as increased organic matter. Um, and we know that increased organic matter can help, help um, improve the nutrient holding capacity and water holding capacity of soils. Um, small grains can also have fibrous root systems um, to scavenge for nutrients and bring those back up to the soil surface. And um, they have the biomass levels to help improve water infiltration and prevent erosion. Um, legume species, such as crimson clover, hairy vetch, um, other clovers, other vetches, um, can of course fix nitrogen. Um, and that nitrogen that is fixed from the atmosphere um, will degrade um, and, and hopefully provide some supplemental nitrogen for the subsequent cash crop. Um, Legumes also provide enough biomass to help with erosion pre prevention and improve water infiltration. Um, and then all, the last kind of class of species of cover crops would be brassicas, um, such as tillage radish or canola. These species have uh, deep tap roots, which can break up soil compaction and also scavenge for nutrients deeper within the soil profile and improve water infiltration. 
Um, this is just going back to legumes and some of the benefits that they can provide. This is a graph showing um, nitrogen production in pounds per acre with some of the different cover crop species. So you can see crimson clover, which is our most common legume cover crop grown in Alabama, can provide it can fix about 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre um, with a good stand. Not all of that nitrogen is going to be available for the subsequent cash crop, but we can typically, depending on when that cash when that uh, legume is terminated, um, see about 30 to 50 pounds of nitrogen um, to help supplement growth of, of the subsequent cash crop. Um, I'd also like to point out that we have some, um, on this, this um, next slide, we have some information sheets um, on some of these various cover crop species that helps to um, discuss some of the benefits that one can receive from various species of cover crops, as well as um, various information on, on planting um, and managing those cover crops. So moving on to cover crop planting, um, this is a, a chart that was put together by the Southern Cover Crop Council, which myself and many other researchers from uh, land grant universities in the Southeast and um, government researchers and farmers have been involved in, in developing some resources. So this is a planting um, guide for some of the various grasses, legumes, and brassicas. Um, we can see that most of our grasses that are grown in Alabama, the optimal planting time is going to be in October, November. The earlier that we can plant um, grasses such as rye and oats, the more growth we, can, um, we tend to get on those and the more biomass that we can achieve. However, some of our cash crops may prevent us from planting early, but um, you know, just ensuring that we plant those as early as possible is going to help help to improve that those biomass levels that we receive. And of course, later into the growing season um, in March and in April is when rye and oats and these other grasses can really put on some high biomass. So terminating as late as possible um, is also going to help with increased biomass production. Legumes. Um, need to be planted, you know, by early November at the latest um, to get good growth on those. Um, crimson clover, again, is going to be our most common uh, legume planted in the, in the southeast. We can expect good growth throughout the state of Alabama with crimson clover and good stands. Um, and those, again, are going to put on most of their growth in around May, March and April. Brassicas, like daikon radishes, really need to be planted early. Um, if they're planted late October, early November, we really don't get very good growth on those at all in, in Alabama. So the earlier, the better um, to receive growth of these brassica cover crops. Um, there are several different me methods for planting these various cover crops. The most common is going to be planting with a no-till drill. This is going to provide the most uniform stand, um, but other other methods such as uh, broadcasting with a spreader um, and aerial broadcasting can be beneficial in certain scenarios as well. So with broadcasting, we typically have to increase recommended seeding rate by 20 to 50 percent. Um, these information sheets that we have on the Southern Cover Crops Council website will discuss some of the different seeding rates for um, planting with a no-till drill versus broadcasting and aerial broadcasting for um, all of the major row crop species. Um, we also have some resource guides for setting up and calibrating drills and spreaders on these, this website, the southerncovercrops.org website, um, to provide some more information on uh, setting up and calibrating drills or, or broadcasters um, to, to plant cover crops. When it comes to managing our, our cover crops and fertilizing, um, it really depends on um, how much biomass uh, you want to produce. Of course, maintaining pH, phosphorus, and potassium according to soil test is going to be important to ensure we have growth of the covers, and that's going to be important for your cash crop as well. Um, so maintaining soil test um, levels of, of pH or of P and K and maintaining soil pH is going to be important for cover crops as well. And nitrogen, again, um, a lot of that has to do with how much biomass you're, you're trying to achieve and how much input you're willing to put into this. Um, so nitrogen, if it's, if, if your 
cash, if your cover crops are planted behind a legume crop such as peanut or soybean, or if you're in a high organic matter soil, if you're not trying to achieve those very high levels of biomass for weed suppression and organic matter buildup, you may not even need to uh, supplement any nitrogen. Um, we can get a good stand of, of various um, brassica and uh, small grain cover crops um, without any nitrogen in, in this type of scenario. Now, for, but for high biomass, there is going to you know, be more inputs to, to provide enough biomass for weed control and, and other such benefits. So supplementing 30 to 50 pounds per of nitrogen per acre will be necessary. And again, planting early is going to help put on um, as much biomass um, as, as later planted cover crops with, with more nitrogen. So this graph that I have on the right um, shows some research that's been done by Kit Balcom of the Soil Dynamics Lab in Alabama showing rye biomass um, according to planting date. So we have uh, mid to late October planted rye here in the blue line, early to mid-November in yellow, mid to late November in green, and then early to mid-December in red. And so you can see that if cover crops are planted early, um, specifically rye in this case, we're getting the same amount of biomass um, when we're planting mid to late October as we would planted, you know, maybe mid-November um, to late November um, with 90 pounds of nitrogen added. And so getting those crops in early is going to be key to, um, to maintaining those biomass levels. Um, and then, of course, if, if we're planting legume cover crops, we still want to inoculate those to promote nitrogen fixation so they can um, fix their own nitrogen. They're not going to, if you have a pure stand, don't need to supplement any nitrogen, um, but we do need to make sure that legume seed is inoculated with the proper inoculant. Um, cover crop termination timing is going to be critical. Um, because we want to be able to optimize, optimize, bio, optimize biomass production, um, but still terminate early enough that we're not going to have negative effects on our cash crop. So uh, we recommend terminating um, typically two to four weeks prior to planting of the cash crop. This helps ensure that we have good soil moisture since actively growing cover crops can deplete soil moisture. Um, and this also is going to allow um, in um, recharge of subsoil moisture um, if, if we get a good rain in there. Um, terminating two to four weeks prior to planting is also going to help prevent nitrogen immobilization. This is particularly important with small grains. Um, because small grains have such a high carbon to nitrogen ratio, um, they can actually um, tie up some of the nitrogen that, that your cash crop is going to need um, in order to grow. And so if we terminate early enough, we can can avoid that scenario. Um, terminating two to four weeks prior to planting can also re reduce the risk of some seedling borne diseases um, and certain insects like cutworms, um, which can um, survive in, in uh, covers until that cash crop is, is coming up out of the ground. And so um, we want to terminate late enough that we optimize biomass production, but early enough um, that we can ensure adequate soil moisture and prevent nitrogen mobilization. So this is it's just kind of a balancing act and figuring out what works best with your particular system. Um, there are several methods of termination, um, but in row crop systems, we're going to typically be talking about chemical termination, and this may be with or without rolling. Um, we have producers in Alabama um, who do both. Um, so um, there's a, we have a lot of information on um, herbicides for terminating cover crops, again, on the southerncovercrops.org website. Um, small grains can be easily terminated with glyphosate, typically. Um, one exception would, would be annual ryegrass, um, since we see some resistance to glyphosate with ryegrass. Um, legumes, tank mixtures of glyphosate with glufonisate, dicamber, 2,4-D. Um, are typically effective. That's what we've, we've seen in research trials as well as um, word from producers. And then brassicas, uh, glyphosate plus 2,4-D can typically be effective. And um, timing of termination relative to cash crop planting will influence whether um, residual herbicide should be um, mixed with 
um, the, the herbicides that you're applying to burn down cover, um, whether those are going to help provide effective control. So for more information on terminating and also um, residual herbicides for um, weed control in, in the cash crop, we have a lot of information on the Southern Cover Crop website that has been provided by various weed scientists throughout the si uh, southeast. Um, some other methods for cover crop termination include rolling and crimping, um, mowing and incorporation, and these two um, methods for termination are more likely used by smaller, um, uh, smaller production systems such as vegetable or fruit production and, and organic systems. Um, but there, there are implements available, as you can see in this picture, um, if, when crops are rolled and then crimped well, um, that can terminate the, the cover. But for some of our species like vetch, um, they, it can take several times of, of going over with a roller crimper in order to kill. Um, so again, there's, there's some more information on these various terminations at the, at the Southern Cover Crops website. Um, at following termination, planting into cover crop residue can be um, intimidating for a lot of producers um, because with high biomass, um, the, it, it can be um, difficult um, if without practice um, to, to achieve seed to soil contact. And so there's going to be some, some modifications to equipment that are likely necessary to ensure that we still get good seed to soil contact um, when planting into to high residue uh, cover crops. And so um, in many of our soils in Alabama, um, we're going to um, need some type of non-inversion tillage um, prior to, to planting um, because we have hard pans that form in, our, in a lot of our soils. And so um, although cover crops can help with, with breaking up some of that compaction, um, research in Alabama has shown that cash crop yield is typically better when we have some kind of um, conservation tillage, non-inversion tillage um, used in the planting row. So in this picture here, you can see we've got a subsoiler um, that's where we've got um, a, a shank that's going deep into the soil to break up that compaction layer and a, a coulter in front of that to ensure that the residue is cut and doesn't wrap around on um, that shank. And so making sure that we have a good sharp coulter that's far enough in front of that shank so that it can, can cut through um, firm ground is going to be important um, if, you're, if you're using a subsoiler or subsoil roller um, prior to planting. And then when planting into cover um, crop residues, wheel cleaners, um, can be used to help ensure good seed to soil contact. Uh, these row cleaners should not should barely touch the soil surface so that they um, sweep residue out of the way, but it doesn't get um, cause hair pinning and um, minimizes soil disturbance. And so, of course, maintaining correct down pressure and using clo closing wheels that are correct for your soil type um, is important when planting into cover crop residue. And um, our friends at University of Georgia have made an excellent video on setting up your planner for planting into cover crop residues. And I've, I've provided a link for that here um, that goes step by step into, into planting into high residue cover crops. Um, just to finish off this webinar, I'd like to talk about some of the research that's being done in Alabama in cover crop systems. Um, one, of the, one of the things that, or one of the topics that we don't have a lot of research on right now is cover crop mixtures. Um, particularly with in, including brassicas and cover crop mixtures within Alabama. And so um, we've got some studies set up at three different locations and different climates and soil types in Alabama to look at um, uh, single species and mixtures of rye, clover, and tillage radish. And we've got any combination of these cover crops, whether it's two-way or three-way mixtures of these covers. And we're examining how those affect various soil properties such as organic matter storage, nutrient content and compaction, as well as some of the production aspects such as insect populations um, in cash crops following these, these various covers and of course cash crop yield. So we're looking at this in some, some cotton soybean rotations and cotton peanut rotations um, throughout the state of Alabama. Um, we're also, again, because we don't have a lot of research on these tillage radish, doing some, some research on these. So we've got studies at a couple of locations in Alabama to look at various radish cultivars um, and planting dates of radishes to see if they're able to um, break through compaction layers. And we're also, you know, taking measurements on, on biomass that's produced with these and length and diameter of roots. So typically we see this large fleshy portion of the, the radish 
um, which, which some people think is, is what's supposed to break through compaction, but radishes actually have this smaller tap root that goes deeper into the soil profile. Uh, this is a picture that one of my graduate students took. Um, it's going to about, a, a, I believe, a foot and a half into the soil. Um, you can still see that radish root growing. He traced it, it that far. So we've, we've got some research to look at that. And then also um, ensuring um, that we're using the right varieties of cover crops and seeding rates um, is important. Some basic research on this, um, just like our cash crops are going to have some very distinct um, uh, properties, our, our uh, cover crops, um, we need to be thinking about what varieties are going to work best in our system. Um, and so, you know, um, we've got some studies throughout the southeast. Auburn is a participant in these studies to look at um, some varieties of rye, oats, and triticale at different seeding rates with and without clover to see how much biomass um, is being produced. And so some of our, we, we have one year of data on this, and some of our early results suggest that maybe we can cut back on our seeding rates for some of these small grains and still maintain the same levels of biomass. So, so cutting back to about 50 pounds per acre, um, if we've got a single species stand of, of rye or oats, can achieve the same, can potentially achieve the same levels of biomass. So we're continuing to evaluate um, basic information like this. So just to end this seminar or this webinar, um, I'll again point you in the direction of some, some resources that can provide some more information, the southerncovercrops.org. Um, contains a, a lot of information on management of cover crops, terminating of cover crops, um, and planning of cover crops. And then the alabamasoilhealth.org um, website on the extension, um, Alabama Extension webpage provides a lot of information on benefits of soil, um, of cover crops and, and improvements in soil health, um, as well as some of the research that's been going in Alabama related to soil, to cover crops. Um, so to end, I'd just like to thank you and provide you with my information if you have any questions.